Good morning. Oh, thanks, guys. Um, and thank you for that introduction. Pico is um, always delighted to meet you as well, if you ever want to come see him. Um, it's a little funny to me, actually, that I'm up here as part of this faculty series because, honestly, I'm generally somewhat ambivalent about gender studies and cognitive psychology. I've too often seen people take a tiny difference and run wild with it, uh, usually in the form of this means men are better than women at X or women are better at Y than men. Um, rather than a careful consideration of are these differences reliable or are they meaningful. However, God did make males and females, uh, meaning that gender is an important part of our humanity and psychology does have something to contribute to the discussion. So I'm going to do my best to faithfully represent the research out there. Uh, today I'm going to focus on the interactions between sex, gender, the brain, and cognition with the goal of helping you understand what the research says now, what it doesn't say, and how to interpret some findings you might read about in the future. Now that's a lofty goal. Uh, so to echo Dr. Hecker and Dr. Wake wrote, uh, who you heard from earlier in this series, our time this morning really is insufficient to fully delve into such a complex issue. And just as they invited you to come talk, if you'd like to have deeper discussion about these issues that arise during the faculty series, I also warmly invite you to go talk to one of them. <laughs> um, just kidding, I'll be happy to chat with you as well, of course. Um, but as one more point of introduction, I'm going to borrow from Dr. Diane Halpern, a widely respected scientist who wrote a book entitled Sex Differences in Cognitive Abilities. At the beginning of her chapter on genes and hormones, she places a warning label says, some of the research and theories described in this chapter, or in our case talk, may be disturbing to your basic belief system. Now she's a research psychologist writing mostly to other academic researchers here, uh, but I think this warning is relevant if you're listening today too. We're all coming in with beliefs about sex and gender, and no matter what those are, I hope we can face the data unafraid. Uh, to start with, I'd like to remind us about a few points that you might recall from previous faculty lectures in this series or just elsewhere in your education. Uh, sex refers to the biological factors that separate men from women, and gender refers to the characteristics and ideas that we associate with one of the sexes. As Dr. Richard Nelson explained in his talk last semester, at the time of conception, your chromosomes determine your sex, two X chromosomes for females, and an X and a Y chromosome for males. The Y chromosome, or lack thereof, uh, triggers sexual differentiation of the fetus, that is, whether the baby develops male or female gonads and other characteristics. And at the same time, the same hormones that trigger physiological differentiation of observable male and female characteristics also trigger neurological differentiation or specialization of the brain um, and its different structures and pathways. The question under debate is whether the neural differences that we see at that point or later are sexually dimorphic. That is, are there distinct male and female brains? And importantly, are those differences meaningful? That is, do any neuroanatomical differences map on to observable differences in behavior or ability? Evidence suggests that, on average, there are some structural and functional differences between brains belonging to males and brains belonging to females. For example, men's brains are typically larger in volume, with some studies showing that to be the case uh, even after accounting for their greater average body size. Uh, women tend to have proportionally more gray matter, or cell bodies, compared to men, as well as greater average overall cortical thickness. Uh, some studies also indicate sex-based differences in the volume or cell density of certain specific structures. Those, those differences tend to be very small. In terms of neural organization, men's brains tend to be more asymmetrical and women's brains tend to be more bilaterally symmetrical, uh, meaning that uh, for most women, structures that do appear on both sides of the brain in both hemispheres 
tend to be about the same size and used at about the same rate. Uh, some studies indicate that negative emotional images result in greater activation in the right amygdala in female, but positive images result in greater right amygdala activation in males, with females generally showing greater responses overall to negative emotional stimuli. Now I believe you are enthralled, right? Um, there are some other differences, but I think you get the idea. Uh, and it's easy to get caught up in the details to look at this neat little list of differences, chalk them up to sexual differentiation due to hormonal or genetic factors, believe that somehow chromosomal sex differences cause neurological differences that explain behavioral, emotional, or cognitive differences between men and women, and move on. But I haven't actually explained anything, nothing at all. Um, all I've actually done is give you a bunch of descriptive information. I've summarized average biological differences between males and females, and for whatever reason, people think the buck stops with the brain. Um, that is, if there are behavioral differences between men and women, as well as brain differences, then those brain differences must have come first. So therefore, they must have given rise to the behavioral differences. In fact, going back to the sex-gender distinction, you've probably been putting the differences I've been describing in the sex category. That is evidence of biological factors that determine the differences between males and females. Maybe you're even thinking, great, God made male and female. Here's some science that shows male and female distinctions outside of our reproductive organs, in the brain itself, that which governs all our thoughts and actions. Excellent. But it's not that simple. Yes, our brain has a strongly biological component, but it's also extremely plastic or flexible. It adapts in response to experiences as well as hormones. One of the challenges that neuroscientists face when trying to interpret gender differences in the brain or behavior is trying to determine what is a more biologically driven difference and what is a more environmentally produced difference. In other words, your brain's structure is a product of your genes, your hormones, and your experiences, and it continues to be molded throughout your lifespan. Researchers in the field refer to this complexity as the issue of entanglement in gender scholarship. Your biology might affect the environment you seek or are placed in, and in turn, that environment shapes your brain. This is one reason that psychologists, neuroscientists, and others often very intentionally refer to neuroanatomical gender differences and gender scholarship rather than exclusively sex differences. Sometimes you'll see both terms are like sex gender with a slash in between um, because the line between those concepts is really fuzzy in psychology. The unwillingness to simply leave it at sex differences isn't out of ignorance or political agenda or an attempt to ignore biology or anything else. It's because your very brain reflects your gendered experience rather than your biological sex by itself. Okay, now that we've acknowledged that males and females have some distinctions in neuroanatomy and maybe learned a little bit about why they do, maybe learned a little bit about why they do, we still have to ask if those distinctions are meaningful or if they actually impact cognition in any noticeable ways. And for our purposes today, cognition and cognitive abilities is going to refer to anything you do with your brain. Uh, reading, math, interpreting emotions, making decisions for yourself or groups, um, solving problems, all that fun stuff. Uh, interestingly, one theory proposes that rather than these male-typical and female-typical neuroanatomical characteristics resulting in sexually dimorphic or distinct abilities, they actually prevent major differences by offering different pathways to similar behavioral outcomes. Uh, greater overall volume in men, greater cell body density in women, uh, but the same average intelligence levels, for example. Um, there's also some evidence from like, birds and rats indicating that although males and females approach some problems differently and they use different neural pathways to get there, they can be equally successful at solving those problems. 
Last semester, Dr. Quattro discussed the importance of allowing men and women an equal chance to do equal work. Uh, some people, though, maybe even in this room, sometimes wonder, mm, but can they really? I mean, aren't better, men better suited to some things and women to others? We can all probably think of examples of tasks that we think in general uh, males or females excel at. Uh, most people, if you ask them what kinds of cognitive tasks men are good at and what kinds of cognitive tasks women are good at, uh, generally believe that women have stronger verbal or language skills than men, and men typically have stronger spatial or mathematical reasoning skills than women. Even if you personally acknowledge that there's individual variability, you're probably at least aware of these stereotypes. Um, you are, like, who's aware of these stereotypes? Show of hands. Aware? Okay, thank you. You're awake. Good. Um, um, but these are empirical questions, meaning that we can test them. And we can look at individual studies, but stronger evidence comes from compiling, compiling data from a lot of studies that investigate the same basic question. And using some statistical techniques, we can perform what's called a meta-analysis, or a large-scale analysis of many studies, across years of research and many publications. And one of the outcomes we're looking for in a meta-analysis is an average effect size, or, how me or a measure of how big a difference is. And here's a visualization of what that might look like. Yeah, we're doing this. Um, <laughs> we've got a couple of distributions, and the, the, it's the, like the bell-shaped curve things with the color underneath. And the distance between those distributions tells us how big the difference between the groups is. So here, we're looking at a medium effect size. Owens D is 0.5 for my stats folks. And what that means, there's about a 67% overlap between the distributions. So about a 64% chance that someone picked at random from the group here right, on the right um, would score higher than someone picked at random from the group on the left. So, um, not amazing, but not terrible. Nice and medium, medium effect. I know you're excited, biology and statistics in one chapel. Aren't you glad you didn't skip today? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, but bear with me, um, even if you're not super pumped about this, because knowing this kind of thing, this general concept, will help you interpret silly psychology clickbait. Um, so now that we know the basics, let's talk specifics. Uh, one classic meta-analysis of gender differences in psychological research comes from Dr. Janet Hyde in 2005, and she actually meta-analyzed 46 other meta-analyses and 124 effect sizes. So much fun, right? Um, but the largest gender differences uh, that they found were in areas of motor performance, such as throwing velocity and throwing distance. Um, differences in throwing velocity, for example, had an average effect size of 2.18, which looked something like this. So here, about 25% of the distributions overlap, and there's about a 94% chance that someone picked at random from the distribution on the right, in the blue, um, would score higher than someone picked at random from the distribution on the left, in the purple. Um, so it's a pretty good chance, and obviously a pretty big difference. Um, most differences, though, 78% of them, in fact, including reading comprehension, mathematical problem solving, and aggression under provocation, were close to zero, or small, uh, with an effect size equal to or less than 0.35, or something like this. Here, about 75% of our distributions overlap. And there's a little less than a 60% chance that someone picked, at random, picked randomly from the male group would score differently and in the expected direction uh, compared to someone picked randomly from the female group. That's not huge. You can see how much teal there is there. Um, so while these differences may be statistically significant, they may not be that practically meaningful uh, unless you're at the very extreme ends of the distribution within your sex. 
In fact, for some abilities, there's more within sex variability than there is between sex variability, meaning that women differ from other women more than they differ from the average man, and vice versa. Uh, if we really want to understand why people vary in skills, uh, and they do, we have to look at education, socioeconomic status, childhood experiences, and all sorts of other, and frankly to me, more interesting <laughs> factors beyond just whether the person is biologically male or female. Uh, one more specific one, because it comes up a lot in the research. Um, mental rotation, which is one measure of spatial ability or your ability to like navigate and understand space, um, showed an effect size of 0.73 in one set of meta-analyses with males scoring higher than females. Even though that's considered a large effect by convention, uh, you can see that there is still substantial overlap, 55% uh, in fact. Though the effect size for this particular and similar difference varies, uh, with this being at the high end, the direction of this finding is fairly consistent, so it's worth asking why. Some studies link spatial or navigational abilities to androgens, or hormones that are typically more prevalent in males. Uh, some support for this comes from uh, studies that show that females who produce an abnormally high level of androgens during the prenatal period show more masculine cognitive patterns, that is, better spatial abilities than verbal abilities, and a preference for more masculine toys, uh, such as trucks, so a specific dependent variable here. Um, <laughs> however, uh, remember that our behaviors are a complex result of genes, hormones, and environment. Children with higher levels of androgens tend to have higher activity levels as well, which may make them more likely to select action-oriented toys and activities, for example. Along these lines, one recent large-scale study, I'm talking 2.5 million participants, yeah, million, thank you, um, in many countries around the world, uh, found that the gender gap in spatial ability decreases in countries with less gender inequality and a higher percentage of people driving, um, possibly related to the fact that they're just using their spatial abilities more. Another study showed that after playing an action video game, gender differences on other spatial tasks were strongly reduced, um, with females showing greater improvement in spatial abilities after their video game training. Yeah, they're excited about that one. Um, yet another set of studies looking at mathematical skills demonstrated that if we test people in matriarchal or egalitarian societies, gender differences in math skills also diminish or disappear. Furthermore, if we test children, we don't always see these differences. Up through early elementary school, boys and girls perform about the same on a variety of numerical tasks. As children age, however, differences become more distinct, generally favoring boys. Some research shows that just becoming aware of these gender-based stereotypes, which many of you indicated you were, um, or being exposed to a teacher who has these stereotypes, even if the teacher isn't intentionally transmitting the idea, predicts the widening gender gap in math performance over the lifespan. Interestingly, if we remind people about their gender or tell them specifically that we're testing gender differences, we also see greater gender differences in performance in the expected directions. But the less people know they're supposed to fail because of their gender, the less they do fail. So this brings us to another important issue in gender scholarship, the overlap between male and female characteristics in both neural physiology and cognitive abilities. There just doesn't see, there just don't seem to be distinctly male or female brains. Rather, recent research suggests that most people's brains are a mosaic of statistically more common male characteristics and statistically more common female characteristics. Men might have more male brain characteristics and women might have more female brain characteristics, but clear sexual dimorphism in the brain just is not there. 
Similarly, there is not a clear line between men and women on cognitive abilities. Even those we consider more strongly masculine or feminine. That is, some women have superior spatial abilities to some men, and some men have superior verbal um, or emotional intuition abilities to some women. Although we associate some behaviors and abilities with being more masculine or feminine, there are not clear male and female cognitive abilities. And why should there be? Let's consider a few arguments that I can take absolutely no credit for developing. I'm drawing heavily from my colleague, our very own Dr. Kevin Eames, uh, who's done a great deal of research in this area. Uh, so let's look again at the biblical idea of male and female. It seems clear, I know you guys are really familiar with these verses by now, but um, it seems clear from Genesis, male and female exist. I created male and female, they're separate, different, but made to function together. And furthermore, if we continue to Genesis 2, females were made to be the helper to males. And scholars who know about this sort of thing have said that the word for helper used in Genesis 2.18 is azer, which refers more to a valuable and powerful ally than a subordinate assistant. In fact, other places in scripture use azer to refer to Yahweh's relationship to Israel or even to a military intervention. Now, we could still consider this information and say, okay, men and women have complementary skills. Biblically, couldn't we still allow that men are better at some things and women at others? And I agree that's possible. But now we have to look at the evidence. Does psychological and neurological evidence support the idea that men have certain God-given cognitive abilities and women others? That cognitive abilities are biologically determined and sexually dimorphic? As a whole, no. You're not gifted with superior mathematical abilities because you're a man or superior emotional intuition because you're a woman. You have gifts because your father loves you. And because you've cultivated certain skills, intentionally or not, over time. Rather than use these differences to feel superior or worse, make others feel inferior uh, based on the stereotypes, let's rejoice in the differences. Maybe even work to improve that which you think you lack. God gave you, male and female, the ability to learn and grow in so many areas. There's a distinction between biological predispositions and biological fatalism. We all have certain biological predispositions, but something as complex as cognition can't be traced back to just our sex chromosomes or hormone levels during development. Your sex is part of your genetic code, which, and your genetic code does make you predisposed or more likely to develop certain abilities, respond in certain ways to certain situations, be treated in certain ways, or even develop disorders, certain disorders at a higher rate. Uh, but your environment is eminently important in developing your identity, of which gender is only a part. That's why you're at college, right? It's to learn and continue developing your gifts and maybe even discover some new ones. So let's put this in some perspective. You're going to be better at some things than others, and your abilities are going to be different from the people around you. It's okay that we're not all the same, and it's okay if you don't fit the stereotype. You're not letting anyone down or doing a disservice to your gender or to God. And I do want to point out it's also okay if you do fit the stereotype. You're still not letting anyone down or doing a disservice to your gender or to God. Uh, it's not okay to assume that you or the person you're looking at fits or should fit the average for their gender or what you think it should be. It's not okay to constrain God's ability to gift you by only, see, only focusing on your sex or your gender as a determining factor of your ability. You are a complex, beautiful image of God. And gender is part of that image. Uh, but going back to how our brains react to our experiences, it just can't be the only part. And it might not even be the most important part. I hope you've noticed some themes emerging from this series of talks. Um, we are called to love and respect the Imago Dei, 
the image of God that we see in humans, male and female, around us. That falling back on stereotypes while easy and tempting flies in the face of that calling. Earlier this semester, Dr. Jackson reminded us that living by stereotypes totally undermines what we are commanded to do, to love our neighbor and to be known. I would even add that it undermines our very nature, our God-given ability to learn, to flourish, and use our individual gifts to further God's kingdom. So what do we take from all this? Uh, are there gender differences in the brain and cognition? On average, yes. Are there individual differences in the brain and cognition? Absolutely. Rather than default to our genes to make us feel superior or hopeless, let's remember that there's more than the biological determinism in regard to our cognitive abilities. Just as my colleagues have exhorted you, I also say that we need to respect each other and ourselves as image bearers and rejoice in the cognitive diversity that we have been blessed with. Thank you.